All right, first question. I've often heard debates in human dimensions over the efficacy of intellectual or factual information versus emotional appeals to change people's minds. What has or could work best with wolves? <laughs> um, yeah. I, we were talking yesterday. Is Carly? Is it nice to meet you? She put you on the spot. She studied emotions for your dissertation. Um, <laughs> no, Carly did a great job, and, and they, they did something really interesting. So I'm, just, I'm jumping to the last part of the question because I don't want to answer the first part. So. Um, and, and they did something really interesting with coyotes after the whole Cape Breton attack, um, in which unfortunately a young woman was killed um, by coyotes. And, and it involved a, a series of activities, as I understand it, remember it. I was on the committee, so I was the outside member of this. Um, it, it involved a, a series of, uh, uh, of practices that they went through where um, people got to, at, what, at one point they got to beat a, a sawhorse that, be, that looked like a coyote, and they were practicing how I might uh, deal with an aggressive animal. Um, so they got to take out a little bit of uh, blood, sweat, and tears on the, on the animal. But, but also involved um, taking uh, perspectives from learning about how the animal behavior, learning about animal behavior and taking the perspective of those animals. That, actually, that idea has a lot of capacity in, in the future to uh, increase tolerance uh, for species. I think if we want to understand something, if, when you get in the head of something, you understand it, it, it's, it becomes far less fearful. Like, I, I'm not going to fear something that I understand so well. And so, um, yes, giving people factual information doesn't work. It's, it's not a very good strategy to use, at least with people that already have a fair amount of information. Um, but I think there are things that you can do. There's information that can be conveyed in a way um, that could have potentially have powerful effects. Go ahead. I would add something to the emotions part. I think that uh, emotions and facts have something really important in common, that they can both be misused and they can be both properly used. Um, and, and so, you know, we shouldn't treat emotions like it's some awful part of our being. Uh, it's just another thing that can be used properly or not. Uh, for my own part, when I'm speaking to somebody who gets particularly emotional, I, I mean, I just recognize as a human being, and they're just indicating to me that they feel extraordinarily passionate about whatever it is that they're communicating. I don't find that offensive. Um, Notwithstanding the fact that emotions just like facts can still be misused. Yes, please. Yes, please. Please do. I want to introduce myself and uh, thank Pathways for having me on this panel discussion. My name is Mark Wesley. I'm the Northeast Region Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I've worked for uh, started with the Division of Wildlife from 1986. I'm a CSU grad, wildlife biology. I've got a degree in geology as well. And I oversee uh, all the wildlife and parks operations for the northeast quarter of the state of Colorado, up to including uh, Denver, Boulder, Estes Park, and where we're at today. So I just want to thank everybody uh, for having me on this panel discussion. Yeah. Thank you for being with us today, Mark. Here's another one. In 1995, Idaho, Idaho brought 12 wolves into the Lolo region. In 2005, there were 512 wolves present. In 2011, there were 800 wolves. In 1995, there were 16,000 elk. In 2006, there were 1,000 elk. What are your talking points to hunters to convince them that wolf reintroduction is a good thing? And John, you, you touched a little bit on that sort of disconnect in your talk. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's a thought that the stats may not be accurate. That's it. The numbers are not accurate. So in 1995, we reintroduced wolves, well, 95 and 96 together, 35 wolves altogether? 30, yeah, yeah, 31, which is, yeah, was it 31? Okay, all 
sorry, 31 ago in his number. Um, so that was over a two-year period. It wasn't, um, it was to the central Idaho area in general. Um, but I would just then de defer back to the hunting statistics that we just saw. Um, I've lived in Idaho almost my entire life, and I know that knowing hunters and having family members that are hunters, that um, elk hunting, um, elk numbers are not that low. We've, we have over 100,000 elk in the state, um, and that um, the hunting opportunities have um, remained steady or increased in most parts um, of the hunting district. So elk hunting in Idaho is, is still you know, very healthy, um, but climate has had a huge impact, as well as um, things like in the Clearwater where we had the turn of the century, a little after the turn of the century, we had massive fires up there in the Clearwater, it's the area that they're referring to, that those fires opened up enormous swaths of uh, a habitat for elk, and the elk populations responded by just um, skyrocketing. But that habitat has changed, and it changed significantly in the last 30 or 40 years as trees were going, um, the undergrowth is turning more into a forest, and it no longer supports the number of elk that are in there. So um, you can't have that number of elk in there. And if you killed every single wolf, you'd not have that number of elk in there that were there historically. Um, you probably have more on this. Sorry, you have to jump down. No, I completely second everything that Suzanne said. I think that's all exactly right. The, the Lolo zone in, in Idaho, that Clearwater region, is a really interesting case. And it was a really celebrated elk hunting area for a long time. And so there are a lot of people that look back on the golden days of elk hunting in that area. Um, but I would argue that there was a confluence of events that, that artificially inflated elk hunting opportunity in that area for a lot of reasons that Suzanne just described. There was also heavy predator suppression beyond wolves um, for decades in that area. And so black bear and mountain lion populations were kept pretty low for quite a while. And a very active industrial timber program um, producing a lot of more feed coming out of that area. Um, so I, I think that what you see now with elk numbers in that area um, is probably more, my own personal view, more of a, a long-term sustainable level. Um, keep in mind, when Lewis and Clark moved through that area, they nearly starved to death due to lack of game in that area. Um, that was, um, fire was still active in that area, but not to the extent that it was nearly after they killed the large birds in the early 1900s. So um, there's just a lot of things going on there, but it's difficult to convey a very nuanced situation um, to people who remember or remember stories from their fathers or grandfathers about these amazing elk hunting opportunities in that area. That's not likely going to come back and I don't think it has much to do with the focus on So I'm gonna add a sub question. <laughs> so um, in addition to some of those facts, and we just give them a previous question about facts aren't always what people are thinking about in terms of their attitudes. What would be some other talking points that you might use for folks who, um, you know, believe these statistics to be to be true? I'm going to do something that could be construed as very mean, but I'm going to ask a question along those lines for Mark because I think he might have some good insights. Because I think that educating hunters is not a specific problem with wolves. It's a it's a general problem. It's a challenging thing to do. Um, and so I just wondered, actually, Mark, what, I mean, you, you must know a great deal about I mean, what are just general strategies for just properly educating hunters? What works and what doesn't work in your experience? I hope that was. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, education is important. Uh, values are important. Uh, we all come from a different place, uh, how we view this issue, and hunters are no different. We have a very strong hunting contingent in the state of Colorado. Um, I'm going to expand a little bit on, on, on my answer here, but uh, the sale of hunting and fishing licenses in a large degree supports the wildlife side of our agency. It really does. So as a state agency involved in wildlife management throughout across the state for all species, we really have to be cognizant of, of those uh, publics out there and reach out to them. We have forums that we uh, utilize. We have big agency instructor meetings. We have uh, regional roundtables, those kinds of things that we that we are able to reach out. But we haven't done a lot of outreach on, on the issue of wolves in Colorado at this point. And uh, I just want to let everybody know that with the ballot initiative 107 on the books right now and being active, 
we were really precluded from taking a stand or an opinion on the success or, or the, the, the positives or negatives or the outcomes of that uh, initiative. So uh, that was one of the reasons why I did not provide a presentation today. So. Okay, next question. Uh, based on y'all's experience in Idaho uh, and just the experiences that, that you all are aware of in Idaho, what can agency staff do to minimize opposition among stakeholder groups at the outset of potential wolf reintroduction in Colorado? Talk to them. <laughs> yeah, so it was a very one-way communication when the wolf reintroduction efforts um, began in Idaho. And uh, there were public meetings, but it was all one way communication. You know, here are our ideas. Um, these are the five proposals we're going to put in front of people. And there was no stakeholder process. And before we got to delisting, we asked, you know, hey, we didn't get to that stakeholder process before wolves were here. What about having a stakeholder process before delisting occurs so that we can better um, prepare ourselves for what happens after the stakes? States take over management, so that things like Idaho's new bounty on wolves may not have necessarily happened. That it wouldn't have been such an extreme reaction to delisting that they are now killing as many wolves as they can. Um, and it is, you know, if, if you compare what's happening in Idaho, just looking at how they're treating species differently, you know, they, they claim they wanted to have um, the right to manage wolves so that they could manage them like black bears and mountain lions. Well, in Idaho, if you're a hunter, you can, or a trapper, you can, actually, just a hunter, you can't trap these species. You can only kill two bears or two mountain lions. Uh, hunters and trappers can kill 20 in one year, wolves, uh, by comparison. And we have, I'm thinking this thousand number is extremely high, probably more in the likelihood of five or 600 wolves in the state, um, especially given the bounty program, especially given that nobody gets prosecuted for killing wolves illegally. Um, that uh, we've really seen a dent in the, in the wolf population because of that. And it's all because of, it goes back to we've never really t had people talking to each other. You know, there's, there's not been any type of dialogue between the stakeholders and, and trying to come to a reasoned way, a reasoned approach of how we make these decisions. It's really informative for me to be able to come to this conference and hear from true experts in the field that have experienced what Colorado is likely to experience in the next few years. And so I think it's really going to be incumbent upon us to develop a robust communication and not just a one-way communication to actually get, get people to the table at, uh, for any successful reintroduction or having wolves here at, at the population level in Colorado. And we struggle with that, to be honest with you, in some of our other forums. If I want to get people to a public meeting, all I have to do is mention prairie dogs. <laughs> or in, in our case, the El Dorado Canyon State Park Trail process. Or um, we had a, about 400 people show up to a meeting many years ago in Fort Collins that was about wolves. And so I, I think the one-way communication doesn't work, so we will definitely have to figure out some better strategies for getting two-way communication and getting groups together so that we can come up with collaborative solutions. Okay, next. Imagine that the wolf had a seat and a voice at the table like any other stakeholder. I'm just talking about stakeholder engagement. So the wolf has a seat and a voice at the table. What would be the opinion of the wolf on reintroduction and how do we assign value to that opinion? Hey, it's a human dimensions conference. <laughs> so, you mentioned before that, um, that a Part of Mesper's culture is um, and part of the creation story and um, involves an obligation among humans to speak on behalf of those who cannot speak. And that's um, a reference to the plants and animals of the tribe's homeland. There's a very specific 
story that describes why animals can no longer speak where they used to, um, and that humans have to give them a voice. Um, so I guess, not being a tribal member myself, I wouldn't feel comfortable going too far down that road, um, but I think that, that there are communities out there that view the relationship with animals in that way, and that attempt to um, provide that voice, or at least account for the needs of some of these species. And of course, this goes way beyond wolves, as to anything in the sun, but um, I guess maybe I should leave it at that. But just to let you know that there, there is a, there's some deep um, cultural beliefs behind that in some communities. So sometimes, this is a common sentiment that's been raised, this notion of if, what if a wolf could have a voice, or how are they represented even though they don't have a literal voice? And then we present it as like this, this otherworldly kind of phenomenon. How in the world would you ever wrestle with that? We do that all the time. There are many human beings that don't have a voice. Young children, those that are sick, how do we make sure that they have a voice? We understand what their needs are and we make sure their needs are taken care of. It's really not very difficult. <laughs> mentioned, um, uh, some of you anyway, uh, mistakes or regrets in wolf reintroduction. Can, can you each reflect on your greatest um, mistake or it, what you think is the greatest mistake or regret? <laughs> we won't keep it too personal here. Um, a greatest mistake or regret related to wolf reintroduction and, and what wisdom has been gained that Colorado can learn from? probably too much to go into in just one answer, but certainly what we just talked about, talking, um, getting the stakeholders involved in the decision making in a meaningful way. Um, the other thing that I would hope we've learned is at the very beginning, especially the first 10 years or so after the reintroduction, we were pretty brutal to the wolves, and we taught the states one thing, and that's how to kill wolves. Um, anytime there was a conflict, it, it usually resulted in wolves dying rather than learning, teaching them how to live with wolves. And I think Colorado will do a much better job at teaching people how to live with them. I don't think we're gonna let you off the hook that easily. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just meant maybe anyone else that wants to win. <laughs> but go ahead, Suzanne, we appreciate it. You know, I think, I think it's a fine question to ask about regrets and to reflect on things that have happened in the past. And some people who know me know that I can be a really quite an incisive critic. But, um, but I, I think, uh, I'm gonna refer to Mike Phillips here. Mike Phillips, I once asked him, Mike, are you a glass half empty or are you a glass half full kind of person? Half full. No, that's not what you said, Mike. What you said, <laughs> what you said, at least what I keep telling people what you said, <laughs> is that you said that glass is not full and I'm not going to stop until it is full. And so I, I think it's a little, <laughs> I, I think it's fine to critique regrets and that sort of thing, but um, it, it's really important to look forward. Um, you have great examples of people who have done this before you, just do better than them. And it doesn't have to be based on criticizing them, just beat them and, uh, and, and make it a celebration, not a, not a lynching or something like that. Yeah, that, that's great. And I guess in that vein, are there, are there um, some bright spots that you all would share that you would want to make sure that Colorado was thinking about? Sort of the converse of that question. Great spot. Um, for folks that didn't come to the values session and see uh, Mike Manfredo's uh, presentation, uh, I think they demonstrated actually rather effectively that the, the social habitat for wolves in Colorado is extremely better than any of the other states where wolves are currently present. And, and I, so if, if there's a bright spot to look forward to, I, I think that that's got to be one. Here we are. We'll just hit on this briefly in my talk, but we've learned so much, and some of that's come from our mistakes. When 
And we, we, we didn't have a manual for how to reintroduce wolves to Idaho and Yellowstone. There was nothing really you know, for an example for us. So of course we were going to make mistakes. Um, but that is there for you to learn from. And then to take some of the highlights from it. Involving kids in the trackable program with the radio colors, that was brilliant. The kids had a blast with that. Um, the wolf that they named from the Nez Perce tribe um, was Chat Chat, which means a meant older brother. Um, and that wolf lived, he, had, he was blind, he had cataracts, he could barely walk, and his pack was still taking care of him. So, you know, we learned compassion also from watching how wolves treated you know, each other. And, so, yeah. I alluded to it in my talk too. I mean, the, the Nez Perce tribe sort of found itself leading um, in the absence of the state in the mid 90s. And so um, I don't think, in answer to the question, I don't think it's necessarily all that complicated. I think um, the tribe wasn't well positioned, frankly, um, to do that. It, it did the best it could. Um, it was resourced externally by the service and others to, to support that effort. Um, it's just basic organizational um, prep and professionalism and um, learning from, as Susanna said, learning from others. We didn't really have a model at that time, but I think Colorado certainly um, has many states to draw from now, and I, I, I have every expectation that if Colorado chooses to proceed with this, it, it's far better position than this first tribe ever could have hoped to arrive. Great, well we sure appreciate all the presentations and insights and the questions from the audience and really uh, what I think has been a thought-provoking uh, couple of plenaries that we've had here. So let's give our presenters and Mark another round of applause for you.